Good morning, everyone. Greetings, Lion family. My name is Michelle Biggs, and I am the Executive Director of Alumni Relations here at Southeastern. We are so excited to have you with us today as we celebrate Homecoming Week. We're kicking it off with a number of virtual events and celebrations for our entire alumni family. Our Alumni Association is very proud to launch this series of interviews with all of our deans to provide updates from each college and exciting insight on future happenings. Before we get started, I do want to remind everyone of a few housekeeping tips. Um, you are all in attendee mode. If you do have a question for the Dean um, during the interview, you can click on the Q&A at the bottom of your screen and um, at the end we'll pull those up and we'll get to as many as those as we can at the end of the interview. So let's jump right on into the introductions. Uh, today we have with us Dr. Dr. Karen Fontenot. Uh, she has served as Dean of the College of Arts, Humanities, and Social Sciences, the largest and most diverse college on campus for 11 years. Prior to that, she was head of the Department of Communications for 10 years. She earned her PhD in Communication Theory and her MJ in Journalism. Although she has taught and worked at other universities, she knows that there's no other place like Southeastern and she's very proud to be a lion. Today's student reporter, Kayla Johnson of New Orleans, plans to graduate December 2020 with a bachelor's degree in communication. As a student reporter for North Shore News, the Emmy award-winning Southeastern Channel, she covers a variety of stories from modern water stations around campus to the Young Entrepreneurs Academy. In her spare time, she enjoys exercising and traveling to new places. Kayla plans to work as a multimedia journalist upon graduation. And with that, take it away, Kayla. Hi, Dr. Fontenot. It's a pleasure to uh, be with here to you here today. Um, I've heard so many nice things about you. And I've also heard about the new renovations to D. Vickers Hall. Can you explain a little bit more about that? Sorry, can you hear me now? Yes, I can hear <laughs> you. <laughs> Technical issue there. Um, so I'm good to go. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Had a mind of its own. <laughs> yes, I'd love to talk about that because that certainly is one of the most interesting things that we have going on. Um, most of your, most of the listeners, most of our alumni have had at least one class in D. Vickers, and they probably remember it less than fondly in terms of the facilities. It's one of the older buildings on campus, and um, it has served its purpose, but we're excited that it's starting a huge renovation. Part of this will be the home of a new broadcast center, but in the process, we're also going to be beefing up every single inch of that building. As Ken Howe, the um, facilities manager told me, not one single inch will be untouched. So that's going to have improvements for our Department of English, our theater program, Bonnie Borden, and world languages and cultures, everything that is in that building. So we're really excited about that. It's going to remain where it is. The footprint will increase, but the location will stay the same. The, I, I, it's, um, you know, it's evolving. So I don't wanna give a whole lot of details because I might give them wrong, but we, anticipate the front of it to be really stunning uh, glass and um, an idea that students can walk by and see the broadcast center, see students at work preparing shows like this, uh, newspaper article, everything that goes into a broadcast center. So we're very excited about that. Wow, that sounds very interesting. When do you think it will be complete? That's also tricky because there are so many uncontrollable issues, but I, we, we've been meeting with the architects all this semester uh, as they draw up plans. We certainly think that within three years, we will have the finished product, but don't hold me to that. <laughs> okay. Now I am a communication major and I am familiar with the Robin, Robin, Robin Roberts internship. Can you tell me a little bit about the internship and how it's associated with Southeastern? Sure. As you know, Robin Roberts is one of our most famous and most involved alumna, alumnus. We're, we're so 
proud of her affiliation with Southeastern and grateful for all that she's done. So last year, she approached us about sponsoring an intern every year. Uh, the first intern was a communication major named Rochelle Riley. I don't know if you know Rochelle, but she yes, had a wonderful time. She went up there. She worked for Good Morning America. She, um, she started uh, a web, webcast uh, that was called The Life of Riley, really cute where she highlighted some of the things that she was learning. And Robin wanted this to, wants this to be an ongoing initiative. Uh, I started talks with her assistant in March of this year, ironically, first week of March, where we were starting to choose the second applicant, the person that would be going this summer. And then as you know, the pandemic hit and yes. we had to postpone it. But as soon as it is safe for our students, we will continue with that program. Well, that's interesting. Yeah. Now, I know COVID has uprooted our lives and changed on-campus activities. How has it changed um, the arts, humanities, and social sciences department? I'm glad you gave me that chance to answer it because I'm really proud of our faculty, students, and staff and the way that they have responded to this challenge. Um, the college has uh, eight departments, one division of general studies, 17 program, degree programs. So it is very large. Uh, one of the things that we thought was very important because students had told us it was important to them was to offer as many face-to-face -face classes as we could. And we have been successful in doing that. We also wanted to provide as many extracurricular activities as we could. Uh, we are charged, the college is charged with providing intellectual and cultural opportunities for students and the community. We, we serve the community a great deal as well. So in, in addition to continuing our high level of academic instruction, we have, with, with every effort to keep students and staff and faculty safe, we have continued with those cultural aspects that we are so proud of. We have had the plays. Um, now, they were in Bonnie Borden, it was socially distanced and uh, we chose, we deliberately chose a play uh, that students would be safe. There wouldn't be a lot of students on the stage at any given time. Opera was a bigger challenge because of course it involves singing and that's one of the things that CDC has said is a danger. And so uh, we chose an opera where at most only two people had to be on the stage and we live streamed it. A lot of what we're doing now is face-to-face -face, but also live streaming. So some of our musical uh, events have been live streamed and broadcast either on the Southeastern channel or on KSLU. Uh, KSLU has been a real, um, a, a real asset to us in this initiative. Uh, Columbia Theater was pr had probably the biggest challenge because Columbia is, is in the college, um, but it also serves the, the community probably to the greater extent of anything we do. And, um, you know, it, <laughs> when we first opened up, it was really restricted in what we could do. Uh, but the director, Jim Winters, is wonderful and very creative and he's got such a committed staff. And so they have come up with uh, programming that is both really enriching and enjoyable and also um, safe. Uh, now, in addition to the pandemic, we've also had hurricanes. So, <laughs> and that's particularly appropriate for Columbia because one of the events that we had last week was the Rocky Horror Picture Show. I don't know if if you're familiar with that, but it's a, it's a real cult event and was very, very popular. And I had people in the community who stopped me and said, I'm so glad you're doing this. We're really looking forward to it. Uh, we were able to have it Thursday night. Mm -hmm. Friday night was a sold out event. And of course, the hurricane put a big dent in that and we've had to reschedule. So, so we have pivoted. We've learned to pivot a great deal and be flexible in everything that we do. Another example of how we're facing the challenges of COVID um, is the contemporary art gallery that's housed in the Department of Visual Arts and Design, uh, one of our most active and energetic, energetic departments. And it also is open to the community as well as students. 
And we have a, a really exciting exhibit right now. If, if people, if the listeners haven't had a chance to go to it, I hope that they will. Um, it's just beautiful and moving and touching. Um, and that is in Clark Hall, you know, on campus. Yes. And that runs through October 29th. So we're socially distancing, people have to wear masks, but we're open for business and have been for months. Wow, that's very interesting. So we've talked about the arts, humanities, and social sciences department. I would like to go into the English department. Sure. Now I've heard they have a new gaming theory. Can you explain more about this theory? I actually can't. <laughs> I can tell you that we've hired a professor, um, Dr. Sam Fuller, and that is his area is gaming theory. But and, and students are very, very excited about it. Um, one of the things that I think is to the advantage of the English department, sometimes people think of our traditional disciplines mm -hmm. like English, like history as being kind of stodgy and not changing. And that's just not true. Uh, we are constantly refining our curriculum and improving our offerings to keep pace with what students want and what the job market wants. You mentioned the English department, and that's a good example. Uh, Dr. Fuller is implementing some of the things he's learned in gaming theory and design to increase what people might be interested in in publishing and so on. We have a, a, an area in English called publishing studies that yeah. focuses on digital publishing and um, helps incorporate computer science and visual arts and communication as well as English to help people with digital publishing as well as traditional publishing. So we're constantly looking at what the discipline is doing and trying to adapt to it. Another example is communication. Since you're a communication major, you may have heard some of the changes we're making in both our undergraduate and our graduate program in yes. communication in part to take advantage of the new broadcast center, but also because that discipline has changed as well. And so we have revamped the undergraduate curriculum to include more things like social media and podcasts and uh, digital communication. And you mentioned that you're a multimedia student. And so we're trying to incorporate more of those things. When I was a communication student, and even when I first started teaching, you either wrote for a newspaper or you worked for a TV station or you reported on you know, radio. There was not a lot of crossover. And now, as you know, it's, look at us. I'm on the computer, you're in the TV station. It's, it's really um, it just everything is incorporated. You know, the, the platforms have become so enmeshed, which is a great thing. Um, so we're doing that in our communication programs. Um, well, I'll stop for a minute and let you <laughs> Well, I'm so glad that the university is staying relevant. Now I wanna go into the psychology department. I understand that there's a new concentration called applied behavior analysis. Can yes. Can you more information about that? Sure, that's another good example of a discipline that uh, a lot of times people thought if you wanted to go into psychology, you would have to get a PhD and then, you know, be pipe smoking, tweed jacket wearing therapist. And, uh, and that discipline has changed considerably too. One of those is the discipline that you talked about, Applied Behavioral Analysis or ABA. And that is a, a fairly new approach where you look at, it's a therapy that looks at learning and behavior. And students can go into that minor, that concentration, and they can graduate and start working as an ABA therapist, uh, working with autistic children, with people that have learning disabilities, with people that have addiction issues. Uh, the whole idea is you can change behavior by looking at some of this, the, the therapies that I've talked about. Psychology also has a very um, job-oriented discipline called industrial organizational uh, psychology that looks at workplace psychology. So it, uh, it's very good for students that might be interested in going into a business environment. Uh, you, you know, a lot of um, 
time management studies and how do you how can you improve the workplace kinds of issues with that right so i know a big issue going on right now in america is police brutality and demanding social justice now i know you are also the dean of uh, sociology and criminal justice can you tell me how that is taking apart right now sure i think it's a very nice combination that our criminal justice degree is housed in the same department that our sociology degree is. And many of the faculty that teach in criminal justice also teach sociology courses and vice versa. So there's a nice crossover there. And as you know, sociology looks at human behavior, group behavior. Um, and so some of the lessons we've learned as sociologists can apply to criminal justice as well. And so I think that we are providing a, um, a much better trained criminal justice force. Uh, and we've been recognized, Southeastern was recognized last year for our online criminal justice degree. We were named in the top 50 of the best criminal justice departments in the country. We're very proud of that, yes. You know, uh, students can take the can get the degree online as well as face-to-face. -face. So we provide opportunities in both areas of that. Um, part of the department is also each year we sponsor a social justice speaker. Mm -hmm. um, in the past, we've had Angela Davis. Uh, we Dr. Fontenot. Sure. Are we I'm running familiar with Angela Davis, but Pardon? for the viewers that are not. Can you explain oh. her involvement in the 1960s and 70s? Okay, I'm sorry. She was kind of a hero of mine. And so I just, <laughs> Angela Davis was um, a very well known civil rights activist, uh, human rights activist, political activist in general. Um, she gained a lot of fame and, and some kinds of notoriety for some of her activities. And she's still involved in trying to help people make their lives better. She's, she's worked with farm workers, she's worked with um, civil rights workers, and she was gracious enough to come and speak to our students. I had the honor of introducing her. And as I said, she was kind of a hero of mine. So that was, that was a big moment for us. She's one example, uh, we were, we were really proud that we had General Honoré as the speaker this spring for our social justice. And he was gonna be talking about environmental justice, which is a large part of, you know, when you talk about social justice, there are so many, there are so many attributes to that. There's um, food scarcity, there is environment, there is political justice and so on. And so General Honoré, uh, who many of your, your listeners will be familiar with, he was our speaker and he was scheduled to speak two days before the lockdown. So we're, we're gonna have to <laughs> reschedule him at some point. He's a wonderful speaker. I don't know if you've ever heard him, but he's a great speaker. So, so I think that's a nice way of, um, of marrying the two demands of sociology and criminal justice, just trying to educate people in both areas. Yes, and how do you think um, these guest speakers like Angela Davis, how do you think they make our students better sociologists, parole officers, or police officers? Well, first of all, you know, and they're always, they're open to everybody on campus. So I would argue that the experience makes everybody better in what they're doing, but certainly uh, listening to somebody who has an international reputation like Angela Davis makes a person who's going into um, policing or into criminal justice, the FBI, some, understand a little bit more, maybe develop some empathy, understand the challenges that other people have. Um, but you could, you could argue that that would be true for a business major or a, um, a nursing major. You know, people in the health sciences need that kind of information as well. So I think it serves the whole university and again, the community. Yes. Now I want to turn our attention to an outreach called Reconnect in the sociology and uh, department. So I know, understand Reconnect, it helps uh, hunger issues and the high rate of unemployment. Can you give me some more information about how it helps the community and outreaches them? Sure. I mentioned that some of, some of the social justice issues that we're involved with have to do with food insecurity as well as the environment and Reconnect kind of 
looks at both of those those issues. Uh, Reconnect is designed to get providing um, more opportunities for to, to get food to those people that really need it and to get good food. So one of the things that it used to do and will do again, you know, we have to keep remembering the pandemic is temporary. You know, it, it will it will be over. <laughs> and so we will at in the future be able to offer things that we've done like a farmer's market. So you might have noticed um, several times a semester the Reconnect group, which is a student organization, yeah. they uh, they sponsor farmers markets where farmers can bring in their produce and people can buy it. Um, it's homegrown and it's healthy, you know, in some cases organic. So it provides an opportunity for our students and community members to to achieve this where they might not have that opportunity. So I know we talked about the departments and the new developments that's going on because of COVID-19. Can you tell me any other new developments in the political science department, general studies? Well, um, in, in those areas, uh, especially in history and political science, uh, they've always been the leaders in providing lectures for our lecture series. Uh, they provide speakers for Fanfare, as well as yeah. Women's History Month, Black History Month, Constitution Day, Veterans Day, Holocaust Remembrance Day. And they have continued that work. Um, of course, they've had to pivot as well. Um, but each Wednesday, we have our Fanfare speakers. Uh, last week, Dr. Burns gave a lecture, and, um, and I guess next week it'll be Dr. Robeson talking about um, various issues. Some of those, again, social distancing, we don't have the crowds that we used to be able to accommodate, but we live stream those and provide them. Um, a, a good example of what I'm talking about is the Holocaust Remembrance Day, which we have every year. And this year, it was right in the middle of the pandemic. We had a graduate student who had interviewed a Holocaust survivor, and it was a, it was a very moving and wonderful presentation. But because he couldn't provide it face to face, he live streamed, it, and it's still available. I would encourage people to to try and access that. So, again, we're doing what we've always done, just slightly differently sometimes. Well, it looks like it is a uh, time up for our conversation. I really enjoyed it and I know the audience did. And now some of the Southeastern alumni have some questions that they want to be, um, that they have. And okay. have you ever, have you seen enrollment in the college increase or decrease in the past number of years? It's increasing. In fact, I found out last week that our uh, graduate enrollment for the communication master's degree increased 47% from 2018 to 2019, it was the largest increase on campus. So we're proud of that. And I think it reflects some of the changes that we're talking about making. Uh, as you know, enrollment overall at Southeastern was up this year and it's up in most of our programs as well. Sociology and criminal justice, for example, the enrollment there is 600 students um, and that's growing as people see the need for um, a more, a more informed populace. How is the culture at Southeastern different from other universities where you have worked? Oh, I mentioned before, and it was the truth that I never want to go anywhere else. I'm so happy at Southeastern. I've taught at larger universities where there was a real disconnect between not just faculty and students, but faculty and other faculty and faculty and alumni and here, I've, I've heard Dr. Crane say so many times, we are a family, but Southeastern is the only place I've ever been that actually lives it and really does act like a, fa a family. You can see it when there's a disaster. Um, people just, for example, poor McNeese, you know, poor McNeese. Uh, people on campus and alumni, they just really turn to and try to help everybody that they could there. There's a real genuine concern for others as well as people that you see every day. Uh, I think that that is one of the most enjoyable things about Southeastern. Which departments have the largest enrollment? Well, I mentioned sociology at 600 for the undergraduates. 
Psychology also has a very large enrollment. Um, right now, I think it's probably at 500, 550 or so as, as um, undergraduate. Um, those are our two largest general studies. You mentioned that a little bit. General studies is a really important and valuable program and it helps students that have more of an interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary approach. And so it's got a very, very large student body too. In fact, at graduation, we graduate more people in general studies than in any other area. How do you see that co your college and the alumni office can work together in the future? Well, we've got a very good relationship already. And uh, Michelle is terrific. Ms. Biggs, Mrs. Biggs is, is wonderful at um, sending me information about alumni that I might not know about so I can get in touch with them. I think that they've been really helpful and will continue to be helpful in outreach. We can be helpful in, um, in cultivating this new body of alumni like you, you know, you will be an alumnus in a couple more months. And so I hope that you, um, okay. Okay, I think that, is that for me? I saw a little question there. I was just trying to read it. Um, so I think that that's one of the things that we can do is work really closely together in creating this informed, involved and active alumni base. Now, one alumni asks, um, we're sad that study abroad has been passed. Has languages and world culture been able to pivot? Yes, they have been pivoted. And once again, let me remind people, this is temporary. Um, we are so hopeful that our very active and, and um, successful study abroad program will be able to come back, if not this coming summer, very, very soon. Uh, we also have an active study away program where students go and study in the United States. And that also is a really active program. Um, but yeah, I, I, think it's, I think it's one of the best opportunities we provide students. And I was really sad that we had to suspend it for this year. Um, that's another program that has pivoted already though. Uh, that used to be Department of Foreign Languages. It is now Department of World Languages and Cultures. Students get a BA in World Languages, but they can concentrate in Spanish, Spanish education, French or French education, or dual languages. And the dual languages is really exciting. We just now started offering Chinese. This is our first semester to offer Chinese. Uh, we will continue doing that. Uh, I think in the next few semesters, we'll be able to offer Arabic. So we're expanding our offerings as the world shrinks. Uh, we're seeing how important it is to have those opportunities. And I hope that our students can, can use those in their study abroad programs. Have you seen the graduation rates increase in the last number of years? And what do you think attributes to that? Attributes to that? I think there are a number of things. I think uh, we've, We've always had good advising, but I think there's been more of an emphasis on advising and more education for faculty, more rewards and so on. And so our students are, are better advised even before they start coming. You know, the Center for Student Excellence does a marvelous job working with first year students. And so our retention for first year to second year has increased considerably too. I think that students recognize the value of a college degree. And so they're willing to um, defer gratification a little bit. You know, um, one of the things that really uh, makes a person successful is the ability to delay gratification. And I think our students are learning that. And so they're sticking with it more. Um, I think that we've provided more support, both financially and emotionally, to students as well. We have a very, very active and successful Dean of Students. Uh, Dr. Willis is amazing. And I think actually there are three of him because I don't see how one person can be everywhere that he is. But he's uh, very responsive to students and student problems and issues. And so I think he's been able to encourage them to stay in school. I think all of it works together as a piece and students benefit. 
what are the most pressing needs of the College of Arts? How can alumni help? That's a good question. Um, one of the things is to continue to support our programs by attending. Um, and, and I don't mean to say that alumni aren't doing that, they are, but uh, that is uh, really important for especially student presenters. Uh, we have undergraduates and graduates that present some of their research or present um, creative work. And to look out and see alumni there means a tremendous amount. It's very emotionally satisfying. Of course, financially supporting is always good as well. Um, we have a number of scholarships that make the difference between students being able to come to college and not being able to come. And so I think the financial support for students is huge. I, I, I don't know how you could quantify it, but it, sir, I've had students who have told me, if I didn't have this particular scholarship, I would not be able to attend. And so I think that that's very important as well. And as always, we call on our alumni to give us support politically in the legislature, uh, locally, and that's a big thing for them to be able to do as well. Any other real world ready initiatives that you can tell us about? Well, let me think. Um, we, all of our programs not only encourage and offer, but in some cases require internships. And uh, I had two internships when I was an undergraduate, and I really think that they were responsible for my first job. And um, it, the, the internships provide uh, not just a learning experience, but a chance for you to get out at a, a bridge between the academic and the professional world. And so um, I think that, that being able to provide internships has helped considerably. Um, I mentioned that I had two. I had one that got me my job and then I had another one that helped me know I didn't want that particular job. So sometimes you learn from an internship and you understand that that's not really where, where your talents lie. And so I think all internships can be val valuable. And as I said, they're required in some of our programs. Uh, study abroad is also a real world ready experience for students who have never been able to travel or who haven't really experienced other cultures um, except for their own. So I think that that's an, another initiative that's very important and valuable. I heard that the World Languages and Cultures Department is offering a new certif certification in teaching English to speakers of other languages. Can you yes. tell us more about that? Yes, well, you, you did a good job describing it. Um, this is um, both an enriching experience, but more importantly, perhaps, a very good employment experience. Uh, more and more cultures are learning the importance of English. 98% uh, of what's on the internet is in English. Mm -hmm. uh, English is the language that's used universally for pilots and air traffic controllers. Um, you could argue whether that's right or wrong, but it's, it's a fact. And so it's an important uh, thing for cultures to be able to offer English. And with this certification, students can get a job both locally or overseas. If you wanted to get a job teaching English um, for speakers of other languages, you could get a job anywhere in the world. I have a niece who spent several years teaching English in South Korea. And she said that that was one of the, <laughs> that was one of the most amazing experiences she's ever had. Uh, and it, it broadened her horizons as well as you know, having an impact on her students. So this is a good opportunity for students if they think they might wanna travel and um, experience other cultures, getting this certification is a really important step. Well, it looks like this is all the time we have today. It's been a great conversation with Dean Fontenot of the College of Arts, Humanities and Social Sciences Department. Um, I hope y'all tune in tomorrow for Dean Tony Phillips from the College of Business joins the Coffee with the Dean at noon on Zoom. Remember, this is all a part of Southeastern's exciting homecoming week. I'm Kayla Johnson, and remember to line up.
Bye, Kayla. Thank you. Thank you. All right. That was great. Oh, thank you very much.